Okay, that was like an eighth of the crowd. So either you aren't listening or I'm not communicating very well. So we're going to try this again, people. And my North Dakota people know that you're going get to pit, get picked on here pretty quick, right, Biz? So the take-home message is... Thank you. Thank you. The same kind of goes true for our porons, um, our topical anaparasitics. Be careful handling those. I, I recently heard of a, a person who preg checked a lot of cows who probably got more than his appropriate dose of one of those. And they couldn't figure out why he was having some pretty large neurological problems. Come to find out, he really wasn't taking care of himself. He'd probably get poured with eight or ten doses a day, not wash his clothes, rewear them the next day, and then they think it's caused some pretty large poisoning. Again, wear gloves with those products. The injectables are not nearly um, as scary, for lack of a better term. So um, the person or the team that developed Ivomec, the ivermectins, actually received a Nobel Prize for human health because of all the people they've saved in third world countries. So those injectable products are exact same products that they use in humans. But they have found some issues there too, and so in those third world countries, they just kind of let it be like we are. We can go in some place and buy it and give it to yourselves. Well, they started finding poisoning in people, and so now they have to go to clinics to get that as well. So again, read the label, figure out what you need to do if you're exposed, take care of yourselves. It is the most important thing we talk about. Next I want to talk about is keeping some good records, and I'm not going to belabor this a lot, probably Dr. Kipp will talk about it, but uh, records are really important. We need to have some vaccination uh, history of our herd, some good herd health records, a herd inventory. So how many of you here are from South Dakota, like I am? Okay, what's going on in South Dakota right now? Pretty large TB case in Northwest South Dakota. I guarantee you, you want to have good herd health records if you get to be involved or a neighbor of somebody who is dealing with an infectious disease. So we have a friend who is a Red Angus breeder in Arkansas. As I walked in this door, my husband called me and he said, uh, did you know that Mike Fountain is under uh, quarantine? I said, no, why? Oh, well his next door neighbor has a trace out from the TB herd in South Dakota. So keep some good herd inventory records and some good purchase and sale records. In your packet here are some examples of those records if you need them, okay? Use them. They don't have to be fancy. They just need to be useful. And all animals need to be individually identified. Now, they don't need to be as fancy as Fiona. Fiona has a pretty good story. She belonged to our assistant state veterinarian in uh, North Dakota, Dr. Beth Wagner. Dr. Beth Carlson now. Well, Fiona had broke her leg as a yearling. Beth had casted it, recasted it, casted it, recasted it, and saved her. Well, Fiona kind of became the pet. And so every year, Beth and her daughter would make Fiona these fancy ear tags, you know, that have sparkles and glitter and all that good stuff on them. Now, I'm not expecting you guys to put sparkles and glitter on your ear tags, and I judge quite a few youth shows, and I see a lot of sparkles and glitter. But we do need to make sure that all animals are in individually identified. And then keep those good treatment records um, that include the product you administer and who you administered it to, the date treated, how you gave that product, the dosage, um, route of administration, so did you give it IM, sub-Q, intranasal, uh, topically, um, implants, for example, and the withdrawal period in the earliest state, the animal will have cleared that. Are you going to talk now? Or are we going to yeah. skip? Okay. So Nicole, I, I want to talk about a project that Nicole has really developed into something uh, pretty awesome. So. We had determined that our uh, ranchers, especially in the western part of the state, who did a lot of rope and drag brandings, weren't handling vaccines the way that would make them the most effective. So one night, as I was driving through North Dakota, I got to thinking about how can I teach these guys to use vaccines a little better. And I came up with this wild idea of using the vaccine cooler that all your vaccines come in into a vaccine um, and having guys make these into shoot side coolers or branding coolers. And so I think Nicole has done an excellent job of actually improving upon this. And uh, I think we really need to give her a hand for that. Um, she's kind of become a star in North Dakota for this. And so I'm going to let Nicole talk about uh, vaccine handling and storage.
Thanks, Lisa. So um, when it comes to vaccines, we need to make sure that we're handling the, the way that they're supposed to be. When they come from the supply store or straight from the company, their uh, efficacy is as high as it's going to be. We're the ones who damage that efficacy. So we need to make sure that we're doing our part to make sure that they're the best product that we're going to be putting into our animals. Temperature abuse is probably the first thing. We need to make sure that those um, vaccines need to stay between 35 and 45 degrees. So we can't pick them up on a hot July day. We can't pick them up in North Dakota. It can be anywhere 50 below. Don't leave them in your car while you go run some more errands or your pickup truck. And we definitely don't need to be putting them on the dash of the pickup, especially when you're preg checking cows in January and you throw them on the dash so that they don't freeze, but you turn the heat up on high because that's not going to be, you're just throwing your money away when you're, when you're putting those products in. So we also need to make sure that we're not um, putting them up on the dash in the hot July day when we're branding or we're working cattle because the ultraviolet rays or the sunlight are also decreasing the efficacy of those vaccines. And if we're working cattle, we need to make sure that we're changing our needles and not disinfecting our needles because what happens when we disinfect a needle? We're killing everything that's around it, right? So if we're disinfecting the needle, we're just killing the vaccine that's going into the animals. So we can't be doing that either. Also, we need to make sure that we're doing the BQA standard and giving shots in the right area and the right way, whatever the label says. So with that being said, Lisa said that she, in the, in the area of the world she lives in, she has a lot of rope and drags. I'm in the area of the world where I have cattle guys with crops or crops guys with cattle. So we don't have a lot of rope and drags. But we've put these together, and these are really inexpensive to use. Uh, find a, If you get your vaccine from the, the dealership or from the, the company, you can use the styrofoam. Guys have modified these for um, coolers that they have just sitting around, old igloo coolers. So you can do it with those as well. But in case this one gets run over or, or jammed or a calf decides that it's going to be his play toy, you can make another one for the next time you work cattle. So you're going to want to drill some holes in the front, and you're going to put some PVC pipe in those holes. And the reason for that is so that your syringe can sit in those holes when you're working. Okay? So that's the first thing. You're going to get a drill bit that looks like that, depending on the size of your, um, your um, syringe. Thank you. You're going to want to make sure that it's appropriate for that. Now we have, in North Dakota, we have taken these and we've used either um, silicone or fill gap spray just to make sure that it actually is a cooler. So if it's cold, cold air is not coming out, cold outside, cold air is not coming in. And if it's warm outside, we don't have the cold air escaping. So we want to make sure that we seal these up as well. We also want to make sure that we're putting a thermometer into our vaccine cooler so that we can make sure that we maintain that 35 to 45 degrees. And we want to make sure we're either putting a heat pack or an ice pack in that cooler to maintain that degrees as well. Now, when it comes to our syringe, we want to make sure that we're taking duct tape or any tape that you have around and wrapping the syringe with it so that we're keeping those sunlight rays out of there so we're keeping the efficacy as high as we possibly can. We also want to make sure that whatever syringe color we have matches the tag on our cooler so that whoever is running the gun knows where that goes when it's being stored. And we want to make sure that we have a marker pen so that when we've um, administered a vaccine to that calf, we can mark it that it's been done so that someone doesn't walk away and say, hey, did you give a shot to that calf? Because it happens, doesn't it? And you go, oh, I don't know. We don't want to give too many, or we don't want to give them. We want to make sure that we're marking them. We also want to take, make sure that we put the, the duct tape on the box of the vaccine. So if someone's going to refill it, they know exactly which um, vaccine goes in that syringe. And on those duct tape things, we want to make sure we have the dosage. So that if someone does pick it up, say you have to run, go get another job, or take a different job, or someone needs a break, or something, they can pick it up, they know exactly what to give, they know where everything is. So that's the vaccine cooler, and it's worked really well in North Dakota, and I hope you all can uh, take it home and, and figure out how to do it yourselves. There are instructions in your packet. If you want to take it home, we did give you instructions there with pictures, but that's, um, that's one way we're trying to keep efficacy of vaccines in North Dakota high through the BQA program. So who's going to go home and make a cooler? 
We make a new one every year at our place, usually because somebody steps in the middle of it. But it's cheap. Our vaccine comes in one of these. I think I priced out this whole thing, minus the syringe and, of course, the vaccine, but with the, the paint stick, um, the pipe, the whole nine yards, uh, including the thermometer, and I bought an ice pack because I forgot to grab one out of the freezer. Um, it was less than 10 bucks. And so unless, you know, whoever steps on it breaks all that stuff, it's pretty recyclable and reusable. So I was asked to talk about darts. Now, um, Nicole, I hope we don't have to have the car ready. Uh, that's what I always say when I'm about to get in trouble. Um, and I'm not going to ask who in this room uses a re uh, remote delivery system or darts. Um, I, I won't make you go to confession today. And so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so one of the things that we know is that there is a huge logarithmic growth in the use of remote delivery systems or darts in the United States. In fact, it's reported that New Dart sold about 4 million darts in 2015. I had a veterinarian tell me about a month ago that he figures that 10%, one out of every 10 cows in the United States, if what the, the sales of New Dart is, is getting darted by a New Dart dart. 10%, one out of every 10. That's pretty crazy, okay? We have had in Beef Quality Assurance some longtime concerns about the use, efficacy, beef safety, human safety, animal safety of darts. And actually beginning in 2012, NCBA and the Academy of Veterinary Consultants requested information regarding those things from the dart companies, and by and large, they've been ignored. Uh, because I think all of us realize that they're being used. All of us realize there's maybe a time and place for use. And so we would like to work together to make that um, as useful as possible for all sides. So here are the BQA concerns. Um, you need to go shoot for the Olympic team if you can hit the neck on a calf that's moving with a dart. Okay? I'm not a good shot. Heck, I couldn't even hit the stupid coyote that was in our yard last weekend. It'd been better off for me to go out and chase him. So you need to be a darn good shot. Um, we are very concerned about the correct route of administration. I'll, I'll talk about that and the correct dosage. Probably from the human side, the consumer side, the packer side, um, there has been broken needles found in muscles and carcasses and cuts of meat. And um, we need to consider the best welfare for the animal and some human safety. So when we talk about our concerns with the route of administration, um, I should have asked if I was a good educator here tonight, how, many, how thick do you think the cattle hide is? Well, uh, typically an animal, a cattle, a bovine, a beef animal, um, its hide is about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch thick. Now, if you're living in the southeast where you have some Brahmin influence, it's probably a little bit thicker. If you're running dairy cattle, it's probably a little bit thinner, okay? Henry's the meat scientist. Am I kind of on target there, Henry? Dr. Kip, am I sort of right there? Okay. No, I did not stand in Long Prairie Pack measuring the thicknesses of, of uh, hides. I took some vet advice on that one. I know. Hey, where are you guys? The Long Prairie guys, is that right? Um, so changes in the labeled route of administration. So if you use a product that is labeled for subcutaneous use and you give that inner muscular into the muscle, so you go from underneath the hide into the muscle, that is a change in route of administration. And that requires an extra label drug use um, prescription from your veterinarian. Now, why is that? because it typically changes the withdrawal time. So you might have a product that the withdrawal time is seven days for one and it goes up to 80 or 90 days for the other. So that's a really big deal. It also might change how, the, how that product works. It might be designed, for example, like implants to work one way and not the other. And we know that for some products, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has said that extra label use is prohibited. And two of those products are Flunixin, you guys all know that as, Banamine, and Exceed. So you cannot give those extra label. Now, I'm going to give my little talk about Banamine, and it'll be quick. What is the route of administration according to label for Banamine? 
IV. Do you know what happens when you give banamine any other way? The injection site lesions are awful. Um, they're about the color of Nicole's shirt and jacket. And while that's really pretty on Nicole, it's not really pretty on a carcass. Nobody wants to eat that, folks. What happens to the withdrawal time? In some cases, over 300 days is what the withdrawal time becomes. So, that's why FDA has said, even for convenience, we cannot give banamine any other way than IV, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. We know, or what we have found with our uh, research on these uh, remote delivery systems, is that side port needles should help with uh, subcutaneous product delivery. And we do have confirmed reports of volatile drug residues um, traced to darts. So this is um, a picture of a bull that was euthanized at University of Nebraska um, at the Great Plains Vet Education Center by Dee Griffin. And so what he did is he hung this bull up on, you know, kind of some a hoist. And then he took a remote delivery system, a dart. Um, he put it in a siding um, scope thing. And he shot it at this bull. So you have an animal that's hanging up, dead, not moving. You have a dart gun and a vice at the same distance. And this is what occurred. D targeted the top of the bull's neck. He used six U darts from New Dart, containing 10 cc's of pin G, and shot that at 10 yards with a green charge. Four of those darts, using a three quarters um, triport needle, delivered medication. Okay, so only two thirds of the darts actually delivered um, a treatment. I don't know what you all spend on antibiotics and animal health products, but that's money down the drain if it didn't do its job. Three appeared to deliver a full dose, one didn't deliver the full dose, and two darts ejected themselves and flew off, pretty much shooting the pin G on the ground. Okay, so there's the efficacy part. I think this is the part that we are maybe not the most concerned about, but is certainly the most alarming, and that is broken needles and muscles and carcasses. Uh, we have confirmed reports of darts and dart components and carcasses uh, at packing plants. Uh, we suspect this is because of the overpowering of the dart charge, um, you know, pumping it too much, using too high of a dart charge, and then that dart actually goes through the hide. And I have to tell you all, that if that traces back to your operation, um, that is an adulteration and it is uh, punishable by law because that's food adulteration. And so it's prosecutable. So these are some darts. This is a dart, excuse me, one dart um, that was found at Cargill. Cargill is not the only packer to find darts. I will tell you that. Cargill is not the only packer. They found this dart in the beef round knuckle so it was not in the neck. The round is the hind quarter of the animal. Here's that cut of meat. Do you all see the dart? Who wanted to have that in your brisket tonight? Which, by the way, was a fabulous meal, and we should thank the Wolf family for that. But how many of you want to eat that again if you find this in your meat? You don't. I worked when a needle was found in a sirloin steak at a major uh, steakhouse in this country. It went through the, the roof of a lady's mouth. They were sued. The restaurant sued. We were able to trace it back. But do you think that lady ever eats beef again? Would you? Maybe not. Yeah, and she tells her story everywhere. So this is where that dart laid or lied. And so with this, uh, the Beef Quality Assurance Advisory Board has issued a BQA advisory statement on the use of pneumatic darts. And this is also in your packet. It looks like this. It's a front to back piece. So here's some reasons to use darts. OK, we ranch in the breaks of the Missouri River. We do a lot of ranching horseback. I know a lot of you here do ranching horseback. That 
that's rugged terrain. I was raised in the mountains of Colorado. I understand. It is sometimes really hard to get cattle to facilities or facilities to cattle in those situations. That may be a place for us to use a dart, okay? Maybe a place for us to use them or when cattle are too weak or they can't move or shouldn't be moved. But I will lay out the argument that if that is the case, we need to euthanize those animals humanely. The picture there on the screen is where the location for humane euthanasia is. It's not between the eyes. That is actually from the outside corner of the eye to the horn or pole. And so the next sheet, oh man, I thought it was the next sheet. This is what happens when you hire a government employee, sorry. Yeah, it is the next sheet, so I guess I did okay on the government. Uh, it says not between the eyes. I think it is our job as producers to know how to humanely euthanize animals. And when you shoot an animal between the eyes and they're not dead, that is not humane euthanasia. In fact, it's not humane. Period. And so, read through this. It actually tells you um, the shot size that is the best to use. I will tell you, do not use hollow point 22s or actually any hollow point um, bullet. And don't use 22 long range bullets uh, because they shatter upon the impact of the skull, okay? And then human safety. Now see, I, I come from a place where we don't run very fast. I mean, obviously I'm not exactly built like an Olympic runner and I'm crippled most of the time. And so if cattle are a little aggressive, they go find a new career with uh, American Foods Group on my plate some other day. But we do at times have aggressive cattle. And if that is a place in which we need to use darts, I'm all for it because human safety is number one, period, okay? So, so here's some thoughts on use. This should not be a substitute for management or stockmanship. I think Dr. Kipp is gonna talk about some stockmanship. This is where I see darts being used all the time. We're in a hurry, we've got other stuff to do, we don't wanna be good managers. I'm sorry guys to be calling a spade a spade. I live on a ranch, I know how things go. But if we are going to be the stewards of animals and the caretakers of animals, it is our job to be that and we need to step up to the plate. When I hear guys tell me that they're using these things in feed yards to treat cattle, I want to go give them a lecture on quit being lazy and maybe get in touch with Dr. Kipp to talk about stewardship and stockmanship, okay? They should not be used for vaccines. We need to use the correct type, length, and gauge of needles half to three quarter inch needles and you know we always talk about in BQA that smaller gauges are better but not with darts. 16 gauge or larger with side port delivery. Okay? Don't use barbed needles. Use a dart size that is equal to the dosage needed. Now I had to give myself a crash course in darts. We don't use dart guns at our place so I had to go to the neighbor's place and have a lesson. So if you need to give 10 cc's a product, use a 10 cc dart. If you need to use a 5 cc product, use a 5 cc dart, okay? What I hear guys doing is that they're using 10 cc darts and mixing stuff in it. 